Hello everyone and greetings from Melbourne. In this keynote today, I'd like to explore the implications of cultural linguistics research for the field of translation studies. I think research in the newly developed field of cultural linguistics has some significant implications for translation studies and in particular for the notion of equivalence. I'll start my talk by briefly introducing the field of cultural linguistics and then I will focus on unpacking cultural conceptualizations behind the notions of khoshbakhti or happiness and bacht, fate, luck, comparing them with conceptualizations of happiness in Anglo-based varieties of English. The main question is the extent to which we can focus on or achieve equivalence during the process of translation when there are conceptual differences between uh, lexical items across the source language and the target language. Now, I'd like to start by defining cultural linguistics, but before that I have to mention that this talk is based on an article that I have co-authored with one of my PhD students, uh, Ms. Bagheri, um, which uh, we are in the process of collecting a bit more data and hopefully the paper will be um, written in complete format. So cultural linguistics, definition of cultural linguistics. Cultural linguistics is a multidisciplinary area of research that explores the relationship between language and cultural conceptualizations and by cultural conceptualizations here I'm referring to conceptual units such as cultural schemas, cultural categories and cultural conceptual metaphors. It's um, the, the, the study of language and culture of course is not nothing new it dates back to uh, the 18th century at least um, but uh, the exploration of language and cultural conceptualization in this particular uh, focus and within the framework um, that I have developed in the last 10 years is, is a pretty new uh, field of inquiry. Um, cultural linguistics uh, draws on several different disciplines including uh, cognitive psychology, cognitive linguistics, anthropological linguistics, um, complexity science, um, distributed cognition, um, but also it um, draws on applied data from applied linguistics areas such as cross-cultural pragmatics, intercultural communication, um, and world Englishes to enrich its um, analytical framework. So cultural linguistics is not um, a pure form of linguistics which has been applied. It's ha it has been its theoretical and its analytical basis have been enriched by data from applied areas as well. So the theoretical framework and the analytical framework for cultural linguistics have been incorporated in my 2011 book which is titled Cultural Conceptualizations and uh, Language, Theoretical Framework and Applications. Um, in terms of the theoretical framework, uh, cultural linguistics, um, the, the theoretical framework of what I have called cultural cognition, cultural conceptualizations and language, basically explores the relationship between language and cult cultural conceptualizations in relation to the broader concept of cultural cognition. That is the theoretical framework for cultural linguistics and of course I'm not going to go into details. Um, there are publications of mine which elaborate on this. I have drawn on um, complexity um, science and the particular the notion of complex adaptive systems in order to theorize uh, cultural cognition. What is uh, very important, I think, at the theoretical level is the understanding that cultural linguistics does not use the notion of culture as a technical term, but instead relies on the notions of cultural cognition and cultural conceptualizations and 
from the very um, beginning, it acknowledges that cultural conceptualizations and cultural cognition are not homogeneous systems shared by the members of a speech community, but they are distributed in a heterogeneous fashion across the members of a speech community. So it basically distances itself from the essentialist forces that were associated with the notion of culture, which um, made the notion of culture and its relationship to language um, unattractive to many people and many people have actually abandoned the notion of culture altogether and in particular studies of language and culture have suffered from uh, such es essentialist and stereotypical uh, forces of culture. So cultural linguistics avoids, as I said, the term culture and instead focuses on cultural conceptualizations and its relationship and the relationship between cultural conceptualizations and the features of human languages. The analytical framework for cultural linguistics uh, basically explores the encoding of cultural schemas, cultural categories and cultural metaphors um, in the features of language from syntactic, morphosyntactic features and um, semantic meaning, pragmatic meaning, discourse structure. So basically um, the features of human languages are explored within cultural linguistics in order to find the parallels of um, the encoding of these features in cultural conceptualizations such as cultural schemas, cultural categories and cultural metaphors. All right, so this is um, a brief introduction to the field of cultural linguistics. Of course, um, I have um, discussed the history of cultural linguistics in more detail in my publications, uh, which are available online. But now I'd like to uh, give some examples of cultural conceptualizations. Um, first I'll start with cultural categories. Uh, there are a number of um, emotions that are um, what I would call cultural uh, emotion categories and Persian has got some good examples of cultural emotion categories and one of them is the notion of khejalat which is a multi-layered uh, cultural emotion which overlaps with um, at least three emotions in um, English. So in some context khejalat can be translated into um, shame in some contexts it can be translated into shyness and in some contexts it can be translated into embarrassment. So um, this particular cultural uh, emotion category is, as I said, multi-layered, is multifaceted, very complex um, and overlaps with three different um, cultural emotion categories in English. Um, an example of cultural schema from Persian again. A, a very good example is the cultural schema that we call Tarof, um, which has been translated into English as um, etiquette, ritual, politeness and things like that. But none of these um, notions really captures what Tarof is. Tarof underlies a, a wide variety of speech acts in Persian. For example, Tarof underlies the speech act of offering um, goods and services when you offer your food. You would like to offer someone to share your food with you. So that is the underlying um, cultural schema, which I have called cultural pragmatic schema, is what we call Tarof. The next step, which is the speech act, is offering goods, for example, such as fruit or food. Um, that particular speech act um, then has got um, associated with it a number of what Jakob May calls pragmemes. 
equivalent of what in linguistics we call phoneme. Um, now, these units of pragmatics are called uh, pragmemes. So, the, one of the pragmemes, for example, for um, the um, speech act of offering goods such as fruit associated with tar off is insist on the offer for several turns. So, as you can see, the underlying um, cultural schema is broad and is associated with a number of speech acts. One of them is offering goods such as fruit or food, and then one of the prag memes associated with this speech act is insist on the offer for several turns. And what Jakob May calls pract, which is the actual linguistic realization, can again be um, in several different formats. And one of them is just simply, please have some fruit and you insist on this for several times. The other person rejects that um, out of um, what we call tarof. So this is what I have explored in a recent um, chapter of mine, uh, where I have offered a model based on uh, such a relationship between cultural schemas, speech acts, prag memes, and practs, um, which this um, diagram here um, tries to represent that the underlying level is the cultural pragmatic schema, and then you've got the speech act, and then you've got the prag meme, and then you've got the pract. So this is a new model uh, for exploring um, speech acts associated with particular cultural schemas, and then realized in a number of prag memes, and then a number of linguistic practs. Now, um, another set of cultural conceptualizations that underlie the use of language are what we call cultural conceptual metaphors. In particular, cultural conceptual metaphors that are associated with human body, which we call embodied, cultural embodied metaphors, are very significant in, in terms of providing pool of semantic and pragmatic meaning for language. So in uh, a book that I edited with my colleagues uh, published in 2008, Culture, Body and Language, we explored um, conceptual metaphors um, associated with a uh, heart and other internal body organs across several languages and cultures. For example, in English, heart, as we know, is the seat of emotion when you say, you know, you broke my heart. So that reflects the underlying conceptualization of heart as the seat of emotion. Interestingly, in languages such as um, Malay and Bahasa Indonesian, um, it's the hati, which traditionally meant liver, which is the seat of emotions. In some Aboriginal languages, it's the belly, uh, which is the seat of emotions. And of course, as we know in Persian, and I have written some articles on this, del, which um, physiologically refers to the abdomen area, but figuratively refers to the heart, is the seat of emotions, desire, mood, passion, memories, personality, and many other um, aspects of um, the human experience. Del is very, very uh, productive in Persian. As I mentioned before, um, cultural linguistics from um, the beginning has had a very uh, significant focus on um, the benefits of its analytical framework for more applied areas and in fact has uh, benefited so much from data from applied linguistics areas such as world Englishes, intercultural communication, cross-cultural pragmatics and teaching of English as an international language and language and politics. So um, applied cultural linguistics and cultural linguistics they really go hand in hand in terms of one provides analytical tools for the exploration of the applied areas and the other one provides very rich data which helps uh, in terms of the development of cultural linguistics as a multidisciplinary uh, field of research. So 
the book Applied Cultural Linguistics, which was published in 2007, includes um, papers that explore areas from second language learning to intercultural communication and uh, world Englishes. But of course, since then, um, cultural linguistics has been applied, um, has been used in applied linguistics areas um, in a variety of fields. All right, now this, um, against the backdrop of this brief introduction uh, about cultural linguistics, I'd like to now focus on um, cultural linguistics and um, translation, the implications of cultural linguistics research for the field of translation studies, as I said. So one of the challenges in the area of uh, translation is rendering underlying cultural conceptualizations from L1 to the target language. And so this has uh, created a kind of need for explorations of the concept of equivalence that of course we have seen a lot of um, models and definitions of what people have proposed called um, formal equivalence, dynamic equivalence, textual equivalence, pragmatic equivalence, functional equivalence. So um, I don't want to go into the details of this, but I, what, what I would like to do is to focus on a couple of concepts in Persian to unpack them conceptually and eventually to see if um, we can really achieve uh, equivalence in um, the process of translation. As I said, the focus here is on the concept of khoshbakhti or happiness in Persian, um, which is composed of um, two elements, which is khosh, means uh, nice, um, and bakht means fate or luck. And I'll talk about this um, in a second. But before that, um, just as a kind of a background, there have been um, a lot of studies of um, emotions across languages and cultures, and in particular, um, a special issue of the International Journal of Language and Culture, which I'm editing, um, was um, dedicated to studies of happiness and pain across um, several languages and, and cultures. In that particular uh, special issue, um, scholars have explored the concept of um, happiness and um, pain across um, various languages. For example, in Danish, the concept of happiness, uh, the author um, observes that it's mainly associated with living in the moment and appreciating very small things in life. Whereas in Chinese, the concept of happiness is associated with the feelings of loving and being loved by family members and of course um, in romantic relationships. In Anglophone cultures, as Goddard and Wierspitzka note, happiness is mainly associated with a state in which an individual experiences good feelings or positive feelings for a while because of what is happening to the individual as a result of their personal pursuits. Um, now, in terms of etymology, khoshbakhti um, in Persian goes back to the old um, Indo-Iranian um, language in which we have the, the root of the word is the word bag, which meant divide or share. Um, the same word bag is the root for the old Persian baga, which meant portion or um, God, the person who gives you your share in life or allotter, that's what we call. The same word, again, is the root for the Middle Persian word of bakhshesh, or tipping, or charitable living, giving, sorry. And 
Also, the same word is the root for the new Persian word Bakhshesh. So the, the old root for the word Bakhshesh is actually Bagh, which is the same root for the word Bakh today. Um, in terms of the meaning of uh, the word Bagh in the old um, Indo-Iranian, Encyclopedia Iranica refers to um, the old Zoroastrian text and it says, you know, Bacht forms part of a whole group of Iranian words which refer to the effect of superior forces on the destinies of people. So in Sasanid uh, Zoroastrianism, the power of fate or the notion of destiny allotted to man is quite prominent. That's what the text says. And numerous literary allusions to this idea can be coded. And it says, in a sense, this idea is part of a wider conception of predestination, the idea that most human fortunes are determined before the birth of the individual, perhaps even as early as the creation of the world. So the word Bacht has got a root in the old um, Persian worldview. Um, which goes back to, as I said, Sasanid Zoroastrianism, where it was believed that the fortunes of human beings are determined before they're born. So when the word meant share or divide, basically it meant man's or woman's share of destiny, which has been determined before their birth. Um, there are other words in Persian um, which have got the same connotations of pre-allotted um, destiny and its associated worldview. And some of them are Esmat, Iqbal, Taqdir, Nasib, and Sarnevesh. All these, and, and in a, a very significant word, uh, is, is Ruzegar. And, and if you think about it, they're very difficult to be translated into English. For example, Ruzegar is really difficult uh, to, to, to translate into English because, as I said, these words have been associated with a particular worldview which has got its root in the old Persian worldview of, of Zoroastrianism. The word Sarnevesht is, is, is a very um, interesting one because it's composed of two morphemes, Sar, which means head, and Nevesht, um, which means script. Basically, the word means um, written on one's head or forehead. Now, so the idea, again, this word goes back to the idea that one's destiny is written on their foreheads. And so people can read your forehead and, and um, tell your destiny. This is very similar to the concept of um, metaposcopy in English, which um, basically has got the same idea that people's um, destinies, behavior, and history are written on their forehead and people used what they call forehead divination. They, they would read people's foreheads in order to tell um, their destiny, for example, predict their destiny. We have in Persian another kind which is um, reading uh, one's palm and they believe that one's destiny is written on their palm. So this is closely associated with that one. Um, in contemporary Persian, um, however, the word bacht is mainly associated with married life or fate in married life. So it does mean fate or destiny, but it's largely associated with fate in married life. So historically speaking, it's sounds like you know the the concept of bacht has changed from pre-allotted fate in the general sense of 
of, of the fate that God has determined in advance for human beings. Two, predestined fate mainly associated with marriage. So there seems to be, there seems uh, to have taken place a conceptual shift from the general sense of uh, human's fate as determined before birth to um, a sort of a more narrower and or, 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 or more focused uh, sense of fate in married life. Um, now, if we look at the number of uh, words in Persian, um, they tell us a bit more about this um, conceptual unpacking of the word. So, as I said, the word khoshbacht, of course, means happy. Um, the word badbacht is ill-fated or miserable. They have a general meaning as well as a more specific meaning, uh, which is associated with a married life. Bacht um, boland, which means a long fate, means basically happy and lucky in married life. Dame um, Bacht, which means on the verge of fate, um, is used to refer to a girl who is about to get married, on the verge of getting married, basically. Khane Bacht, which means house of fate, the expression basically refers to marriage. So someone, a girl going to the house of fate, or Khane Bacht, basically means um, getting married. Shotorebach, the camel of fate, this is an interesting one. Um, basically, it means luck in getting married. And we have an expression, we say, um, the camel of fate has kneeled in front of the door of this person's house. So that means the person is lucky um, to have found uh, for example, to have found a very good uh, husband. The, in Persian ancient folk epic, this camel um, belonged to a king. It's a strong um, camel. It's got a long um, neck. It's red. Um, and the parents of this camel, um, the mother was a Persian camel and the father was an Arabic camel. So the offspring is what is called um, the, um, this camel, which is the camel of luck. Um, in fact, um, in the old days um, in Iran, um, people going to their married um, house um, would have their um, um, the new um, furniture and everything for their life carried away with um, camels. So camel has got a very uh, significant symbolic role associated with marriage and with good luck. Um, Negunbacht, which means fallen fate, basically means unhappy in married life. Goshayeshe um, bacht, or opening of fate, and bastane bacht, or, which is closing of fate, are, are very interesting. Because opening of fate basically means getting married. And someone whose fate, or bacht, has been closed, um, is someone who is unable to get married due to supernatural forces who have cast um, a charm on this person and so this person um, can find um, the right spouse. Now, Bacht can be associated with different colors. For example, we have the word Sefid Bacht or white fate, which refers to being happy in married life. Siyah bacht, or black fate, refers to being unhappy in married life. Sabz bacht, or green fate, again means happy in married life. 
tire bacht or dark fate, basically means ill-fated in the general sense of the word, kur bacht or blind fate refers to, again, ill-fated, but in general sense of the word. Shur bacht, salty fate, means ill-fated. This one, I think, is associated with um, a cultural schema in Persian where someone who has got destructive powers and can cast damaging charms on other people, particularly as a result of jealousy, is called to have salty eyes or cheshmashur. And I think the idea is that this person has cast some charm on a girl and so this person, this girl is not finding um, a husband. So that's what we refer to as shurbacht. So salt has got a very significant uh, place in general in, in Persian language. It has many different um, meanings and conceptualizations associated with it. But this particular one is, is a, like, a, as I said, um, a, a charm which has been casted on um, someone's fate. Lebasse sefid bacht, or dress white fate, basically refers to bride's wedding dress. Or even we call it just simply lebasse bacht or the dress of fate. And wearing, metaphorically, wearing this white dress of fate basically means getting married. Now in terms of the cultural conceptualizations underlying some of these expressions that we have just reviewed, Sefid Bacht and Sabs Bacht color um, sound to reflect the conceptualization of happy married life is having a white fate or green fate. The conceptualization underlying um, siah bacht or black fate is unhappy married life is having a black fate. Bach de Boland reflects the conceptualization of long as good and or lucky. This is also reflected in the expression that we say lucky people have got high foreheads. Um, so again, the conceptualization of forehead and of, of course long have been blended into meaning someone who's got high for it is very lucky. I mentioned this one before, Goshayeshe Bacht, which means opening of fate, reflects the conceptualization of getting married is opening of one's fate. And so someone who is not having luck in finding a husband is said to have their fate closed, which basically means someone has cast charms on the fate or the bacht of this person. That's why this person is not um, able to find a husband, for example. And people actually go and um, seek um, particular um, cures, for example, from um, particular healers or particular praise for opening of the fate of people. So, from what I have just presented here, it sounds like we have three different layers, conceptual layers. One is the underlying um, worldview and the belief, the very ancient belief 
that human fortunes are determined before the birth of the individual. So this is of course not just a specific to Persian, in several other cultures we see the same idea of a pre-allotted destiny. But of course, again as I said, this is in particular um, seems to underlie the words for um, happiness and, 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 and fate in, in Persian. So that's the underlying level, which is the, the, the world view. The second level um, is the level of cultural conceptualizations, where the underlying worldview has been sort of narrowed and been associated with a particular experience such as getting married. So marriage as luck or fate. So the, under, the underlying worldview is in a very broad sense. When I say it's in a broad sense of human fortunes are determined before the birth, that excludes the ability to choose right and wrong. The old religious um, beliefs of Persians um, gave the option of choosing between right and wrong. So human beings doing good or bad were not determined uh, before their birth. But their fortunes in terms of um, their fate in life was determined before life. And that, as I said, although the, the general idea has been sort of um, disbanded and, and abandoned, um, the association of that pre-allotted destiny has remained closely associated with marriage. And so this is the uh, second layer. So the underlying la layer is worldview. Then the next one is the cultural conceptualization, which is a bit more specific. And the third level is the level of language, which you have words that reflect these cultural conceptualizations. So, um, this is basically how I think we can represent this phenomena. That underlying level is the worldview, and the second layer is cultural conceptualization, and language encodes these cultural conceptualizations. But this is by no means um, an indication or, or the claim that this is how speakers of Persian think. In fact, um, in, in contemporary society, a lot of people actually question, there are websites where people question the, the whole idea of um, the destiny, the pre-allotted destiny, and say, oh, marriage is a matter of choice, is a matter of um, you um, choosing your own destiny. So particularly under the influence of, of uh, modern psychology, um, and trends, modern trends in psychology, a lot of people you know, question um, these conceptualizations. But, but of course, um, this doesn't go against the, uh, what I'm presenting here, which is the fact that one concept, if you unpack it, you can go back to history and you can see traces of cultural conceptualizations and, and further down, um, traces of uh, worldview. In, in one particular uh, word. So, um, the lessons from what I have just presented here, I think, um, first of all, studies of um, cultural conceptualizations and cultural linguistics in general, I think they reveal that language is serving as a kind of a memory bank if you like, as a metaphor, for cultural conceptualizations past and, and present. So um, language basically provides a kind of window or an archive to 
cultural conceptualizations. Therefore, study, studies of language can um, provide rich data about you know, the older worldviews and cultural conceptualizations. Um, I think what I have just presented here is, is a very good um, example of what Anna Vyshpitska um, calls a whole drop of culture condensed into a drop of semantics, um, which is um, another version of Wittgenstein's uh, statement, a whole drop of philosophy condensed into a drop of grammar. But of course here, um, uh, what I have presented I think is, is more, um, I, I, I can call it a whole drop of cultural conceptualizations and worldview condensed into a drop of semantics. Now, implications for the notion of equivalence, um, such as dynamic and formal equivalence in, in translation studies. Again, um, I, I, I don't claim to have any uh, solution to this question of equivalence. How can we achieve equivalence when translating from one language to another one? Some people argue that you have to translate the sense that's the meaning of dynamic equivalence. And some people argue that you have to translate the word. But I think um, from what I have presented here, we can see that um, neither the sense nor the word, if translated, can render necessarily the cultural conceptualizations or the worldview that is associated with the particular world. So, I think all I can say is that um, we need to um, pay closer attention to the conceptual aspect of translation, particularly conceptual dimensions that are culturally constructed. And that's where cultural linguistics can make some contributions. Now, cultural linguistics um, at the moment, just uh, for the information of the audience, um, in terms of the um, recent um, advancements in the field of cultural linguistics, um, there's now the International Journal of Language and Culture, which was launched in 2013 by John Benjamins. Um, recently, Routledge published the Routledge Handbook of Language and Culture. Uh, the first handbook of language and culture uh, published um, ever. Um, recently, Springer, um, the second biggest publisher in the world, launched a new book series with the name Cultural Linguistics. And there are already three books um, being prepared um, to be published by Springer on cultural linguistics. Uh, in particular, there is a book that I'm editing called Advances in Cultural Linguistics, and on my webpage you can see the um, abstracts of the contributions to the book. It's a book with more than 32 chapters um, on a variety of topics in cultural linguistics. And of course, we have the first International Conference of Cultural Linguistics in this year, in 2016, in July, in Prato, in Italy. Um, Cultural linguistics um, has also, as I mentioned before, has been uh, productively uh, applied to the um, studies of teaching English as an international language. I don't have the time to go into that. But um, the concept of metacultural competence is proving to be very popular among um, um, some scholars. So um, there are studies that I have recently um, published uh, people can refer to that notion of metacultural competence, which is very productive for particularly intercultural communication as well. Um, so this is the competence that enables interlocutors to communicate and negotiate their cultural conceptualizations during intercultural communication. So with that, um, I um, end uh, this talk and thank you for listening.